Welcome to Recalibrate Reality. After two years of working from home and multiple stops and starts with returning to the office, we finally reached the point where companies are starting to bring their employees back. We know that the office experience won't be the same as it was pre-pandemic, but there are still many unanswered questions when it comes to the future of work. Our guest today has been thinking about this topic long before anyone else. Nick Bloom is a professor at Stanford University, and he's been researching work from home for almost 20 years. In this episode, Nick and I discuss what his research says about the future of work and how CEOs and policymakers can prepare for work in the new normal. And so now, let's recalibrate reality with Nick Bloom. Nick, welcome to Recalibrate Reality. I appreciate you joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Scott. So, so it feels like we're finally reaching uh, the precipice where people are truly thinking about returning to, to work and, and, and companies are you know, bringing their teams back. Even the federal government now is talking about bringing people back to the workplace. And at RxR last week, we actually saw our la- largest occupancy uh, in our building since the pandemic began. So I think this is not a false start. It's going to happen. And, and many people have a lot of, uh, uh, you know, views as to sort of what remote work is going to be like, what hybrid work is going to be like, what the future of the workplace is going to be like. Uh, myself, a lot of our guests, but but you've been studying this for years, even before the pandemic. And so it'd be interesting to see, you know, what's your research? What's the data tell you about how this ultimately shakes out? Sure, absolutely. So, yes, you know, weirdly enough, I've been studying this for almost 20 years. So it was a very boring topic until March 2020, and then it just exploded. So I'm going to tell you based on really two sources of data. One of the first source is surveys. So I've been surveying around 5,000 Americans a month, around 1,000 firms. And the other is just talking to like hundreds. You know, we talked earlier about hundreds and hundreds of execs and firms, not just companies. So what we're seeing is in the US, roughly half of all employees can't work from home. So these are like frontline retail, you know, burger flippers, people that, you know, have uh, security jobs, et cetera. Of the other half, the folks that are probably most people listening, professionals, managers, people that are kind of basically university graduates, are typically going to be on hybrid jobs. And that's about 35% of the labor market. So the typical thing there will be in the office three days a week. Take like what Apple's announced. You come in Monday, Tuesday, Thursday. You have like three days of really compressed, vibrant meetings and events, leaving, dues, trainings, lunches, meeting with clients and customers, really social and then two days a week you work from home. And then there's a final group, they're about 15%, that are likely to remain fully remote. But these are much more folks like IT support, payroll, some payments processing, people that mostly are not managing teams. So any professional listening, the odds are you're gonna be you know, hybrid, typically three, two post pandemic. You know, you know, it's interesting, and I, I have this similar view, and actually we had Sandy Mithrani on from WeWork, and he sort of said, uh, that you know, it's, he views it's going to revert to the mean of three to four days a week in, in the in the workplace. But you know, there's this you know incredible war for talent out there right now, and and you know, yeah. there's this there's this tension between management and the rank and file when it comes to returning to the office. Every CEO I speak to, every head of HR, they want their people back. They realize the importance of bringing people you know in back as to work as a team. The social capital it builds, um, the the culture it builds, the chance to give people the opportunity to uh, to be mentored and, and grow, but but employees feel like they've gotten you know new habits. They're comfortable working from home. They they you know have found the place to sort of work around that when they work out, walk their dog, spend time with their families, and it's hard to like you know change that that moment. Then there have anxiety, obviously. So how do you think in this tight labor market, you know, you deal with this this tug of rope that's going on between management and 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 the frontline people? Well, again, it's worth you know knowing the data. So just to give you another set of rough figures, about a quarter of people when we serve, so we've surveyed like 50,000 Americans by now, so it's very robust. In fact, similar data I just got in across Europe. Around a quarter of people ne- never want to work from home again. They want to come in five days a week. They're like lonely and isolated. They, let, they load it. There's then another quarter at the other extreme that love working from home and <laughs> never want to go into the office ever again. And then the remaining half is spread roughly equally between coming in one, two, three, or four days a week. So the first thing is you've got this kind of dumbbell-shaped distribution. So it's really hard. And if you're a manager, any organization, you have people at either extremes. 
but the average is about two to three days a week. So if you as a firm or an organization are picking one rule for everyone, for all the professionals and managers, two to three days a week, it's like in the center. I get it that a lot of people, it's not going to be perfect, but you know, it's kind of moderation. So much as you pick working hours and time, so there are lots of things in an office you have to pick, like let's go with the mean and what, you know, it's typically people want, that will be that. Um, now, the other thing is it gets misportrayed in a horrible way that people say, look, no one wants to return or this year wants everyone to return. Generally, when I talk to execs, they mean return like two, three days a week, which I'm totally on board with. And in fact, that's what most employees want. The only real outliers I'm aware of are, for example, Goldman Sachs went out early on and said people are going to come in five days a week. That view and JP Morgan did. They were really the only two I know of big firms that's kind of died. So neither of them have succeeded in getting their folks back five days a week. And I'm not sure they ever will. And all other big firms, I mean, Merrill Lynch, you know, Morgan Stanley, Citibank, et cetera, have said three days a week. And I think that is driven, you're right, by the labor market. It's, you know, we have data, we survey people and 60% of people say, look, if my employer asked me to come back five days a week, I would. But the other 40% said they'd actively look for another job or quit. And if you're a firm, you can't really afford to lose 40% of your staff. So the reality of 2022 onwards is hybrid is here to stay, but it's definitely not fully remote for most companies, but it's also not fully in person. You know, my best analogy is drinking wine, right? It's like, we all like to drink wine, but, you know, zero wine is probably not ideal, but, you know, 10 bottles is not ideal. Either. You just want something in the middle. And working from home and working in the office are very similar. We probably want two, three days a week in the office two, three days a week at home. And that, if it's well-organized, works well. Yeah, and I, I think also just from, from watching uh, our team members and talking to a lot of our clients, it's, it, it's something that it's going to evolve over time, right? When people start coming back to the workplace, they see what's going to work, I guess, for different cohorts, different parts of the organization. Um, and then they'll have, you know, they'll, they'll develop different protocols. You know, maybe, as you said, there's specific days of the week, or maybe there'll be, uh, you know, certain departments do it where they'll have, a flex day, depending on what someone's doing, where they can get the best of remote work and the flexibility that they that they would want, and also uh, the best of being uh, in in the office. But I'm curious in your when you, you you made the point about the the averages, which I always get. You know, when you listen to statistics, that's where you get caught up, right? And the averages, and they all sort of come together. Are there any specific uh, cohorts? You know, in terms of maybe age or professions. That are any are either side of that barbell is the Gen Z are the ones that say you know what I'm I, I like this remote this flexibility this is what I want or, uh, or you know or an industry in particular or a sector in particular. Quite amazingly, actually, it's very flat. So if you looked at it by age, young folks, so twenty to thirty, and those from fifty to sixty-four have a slightly higher preference to come into the office. Folks in the more middle age, slightly lower, but that gap isn't that big. And it's primarily explained by having young kids. So, you know, 20 to 30s and 50 pluses don't tend to have young children. And once you control for that, it flattens. By gender, it's actually very flat. Women have a slightly higher preference. Again, not much to work from home. There's some variation by race, by, you know, it, people that self-identify as black, Asian or Hispanic in our service report slightly higher preferences. Again, not a big difference. The, may, the only thing we see huge variations by is education. And that's really by the ability to work from home, not the preference to. So if you look at people that have a university degree or above, they have about five times the rate of being able to work from home. They tell us their employers have offered them versus if you left school at 16 or less. So basically, when you talk about work from home, we're really talking about professionals, managers, et cetera. I mean, I... On your comment earlier, there's a couple of things I should say that come up regularly. One is, you're, you're right, this is hugely experimental. So we're in a weird world because during the pandemic, we wanted people to socially distance, stay at home. When they came into work, they didn't overlap. You know, before the pandemic, no one was really running large-scale hybrid. So we're about to, post-pandemic, go into a brave new world. And I generally advise, you know, boring vanilla 3-2 hybrid is the best bet to do in the short run. It's not that that's going to be the final plan, but if it were my firm and I had a big company, that's kind of a safe bet. So look, you're going to come in, I don't know, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. You're going to work from home Monday, Friday. We'll see how that goes for the next three months, and then we're up date. And that seems a kind of safe bet to do. Another big issue is a huge kind of, kind of mindful right now is choice versus coordination. So 
Like, Scott, if you and I worked in the same firm, well, I, I just tell you a number. I just saw it this morning, actually, in our most recent poll. We polled 5,000 people in uh, February 2022. 75% of them said they want to choose which days they work from home. 75%, as in most people answering yes to both, said that when they come in, they want their colleagues to be in on the same day with them. And you're like, but they're totally inconsistent. You can't right. choose and then coordinate. So another big battleground is going to be do managers or the whole firm say, here are the days you're all coming in, so that you're in together, or do you let people choose? And my view on that is I'm pretty strongly in favor of coordination. And the reason when you ask people why they want to be in work, they want to be in work to be around their colleagues and have face-to-face -face meetings and meet clients and go to lunches and leaving those. And that doesn't work if like we're in on some days and not in on others. And you know, if you think back to 2019, we basically as society coordinated on coming to work 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. roughly Monday to Friday. Like if you said, you know, Nick, I'm going to come into work actually from like 6 p.m. to 9 you know, a.m., we like, are you, are you joking? Like no one else is in the firm there. I'm going to work on weekends. So that is another big issue. But I think we're going to end up probably coordinating in some kind of hybrid version. And it's either going to be at the team level or the, the whole company level. I think that's a, an important point you make because you really need to be intentional about when people come to work, what they do when they're at work, so that you really are getting that sense of engagement, that collaboration. You don't need them to come to work and sit in their office or at their cubicle doing video conferencing, right? And at the same token, I think, which is interesting that we've seen is you need to also be intentional in setting some guidelines when people are working remotely. You know, one thing that we saw as people began to work remotely and we watched our data was that, you know, it wasn't people who were, were working at home, they were living at work, right? There was no boundaries between, you know, when they, when, when they turned on their computer, when they turned it off, when people would make phone calls, you know, weekday or weekends. And I think that needs, that paradigm also needs to shift uh, to really make this uh, make this effective as we as we go forward. Yeah, you know, and is another issue that's coming up a bit. I just jump on something you mentioned earlier, which is on equity of policy. So another tricky thing. I've had this with two or three organisations uh, where they said, you know, we have multiple divisions and there's a lot of mobility within the company across divisions, and they said we really want to set a common policy at the company level, because you don't want people moving from, say, in the, you know, the EMEA region to the North America region, because the EMEA region only offers one day work from home and North America offers three, and it's kind of a race to the bottom. So one is, I think, coordination on days of the week. The other is, I think, CEOs or CHRs really need to decide what's the policy. And for most companies, there's probably going to be three groups. There's going to be come in five days a week. They kind of tend to be lower paid frontline staff. There's folks that are fully remote, IT support, a bunch of HR payroll. Many of these people are actually often outsourced. So I mean, it's not clear you want to be in that area, actually. And then the third is all the professionals and managers. And for those guys, I think companies probably want a common policy because otherwise you get equity. You know, imagine saying you're going to be paid more on a different healthcare plan for this division. It would be like hugely uh, you know, upsetting. So I think equity is another area along with coordination that's going to jump up, actually. Yeah, and I think, you know, to your point on equity, that's been one of the areas that I've been very focused and concerned about, about is this widening uh, divergence of, of inequity. You know, even during the pandemic, and one of the reasons we came back as quick as we had is we had our frontline workers, our essential workers, they had no choice but to be uh, supporting our buildings, managing our buildings, handling our security. Um, they, were in the, they were there every day, right? Same with our public, you know, health people and, 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 and the firefighters and police and so I kind of feel like that it's, it's, you know, there's a level of balance here that almost, you know, from a, a societal perspective, we all need to say we're doing our part. And then even when you think about, you know, I, I think people forget about this is, you know, the offices aren't about just being in the buildings themselves. It's the ecosystem um, that support the communities, right? It's the people in the offices that go to the restaurants that support the small businesses, the shops, the, the florists, the dry cleaners. And if that stops working, the whole ecosystem breaks down. And then that inequality you're speaking about, you know, becomes something even that's more pronounced uh, than before, which is another reason I think we need to, as, as a whole, decide that we're going to, you know, come back and support our communities. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that raises an issue for, you know, I live near San Francisco, you're out in New York for big cities. So another very set, kind of related topic, but, you know, separate in some ways is the evidence of what we, we find called the donut effect. So we've been scraping US 
postal service change of address data. So there's a roughly 200 million households in the US and you get the monthly files on the address. And what we can see is in large US cities, so you know, New York, San Francisco, Washington, LA, Atlanta, Dallas, et cetera, they've lost about 10% of residents in the very core city center out to the suburbs. And the reason is hybrid. So, you know, people can see, they can see that in future, they're only going to have to commute, say, two, three days a week. And they're thinking, I can put up with a longer commute, but I do want a home office. And so they're moving out. And that, you know, that's a phenomenon that's basically happened. You can see it. And it's kind of, you know, the, the, the city centers have dropped a little bit in population. The thing that is less clear is what happens to commercial real estate. What I'm generally seeing is companies are sticking with headquarters in the city center because the view is if you're operating hybrid, you still want when people come in, it's easy, it's a nice office, it's a you know good location to come to. You want them to come in and be happy and come into work for three days a week. But you know, again, that's it's slightly hard to predict where that's going. But so far, individuals are moving out a bit, but city centers are still doing fine. There's a bit reduced footfall because there's less people coming in every day, but there's still a quite a lot of commercial activity. And so, you know, city centers are dropping maybe 10 years worth of growth. You know, we're going back to San Francisco, maybe back where it was 10, 15 years ago, but it's definitely not apocalyptic by any means. Yeah, well, it's, you know, it's interesting. When you look at New York, what we've seen is there's been a big influx of talent um, that have come. If you look at, for example, the apartment market, you know, the apartment market's back up to 98% occupied. may not be the same people because we also have seen some of that that flow out to the the suburbs that you described before, where you know people are willing to live a little bit further away, knowing they don't have to commute uh, as often. Uh, but all, you know, to your point, the big companies continue to expand here, whether it's the Googles, the J.P. Morgans, um, the the Facebooks, the Amazons, and they're they're actually this is flight to quality, right? Where they're trying to get the, the highest quality office space because you know I, I, I think what they believe is they got to make it magnetic to attract people back, right? It's gotta be energizing for people to come back to, uh, to the workplace. But I do, I do think to your point, there's, there's gonna be some systemic structural issues with our cities. And I'm curious to see, you know, what you think, like if you think about if people aren't using, for example, our, our commuter rail system as frequently, you know, these, these are, are structurally gonna find themselves imbalanced, right? And, and so it's, I think, you know, I, there's gotta be some reimagining of the city in terms of ways to sort of create sort of 24 seven live work play phenomena. Is, is this something that you've thought about or heard about in terms of uh, some, as you go through your research? Definitely. So there are two challenges. I mean, mostly I feel very positive about the future of cities. So exactly as you say, look, some of the higher earning, you know, I think of San Francisco, a lot of the techies have moved out because they, they moved out to the suburbs, but that, that, probably still very valuable. The rental rates relatively fallen a bit, but that tends to move other people in. I mean, this is the beauty of free markets that, right. you know, the property is not remaining empty. Relatively, the suburbs become more expensive than the city centers, but that's a, attracted other folks in that previously wanted to live in the center, but it's become too expensive. So the two things I see are challenges. One is public sector spending. So if you look at big cities like New York and San Francisco, they get money from property taxes. They get money from retail taxes. They also get money from business and also high-end hotel occupancy. And all four of them, particularly hotels, are very problematic. So business travels down probably permanently 30% because people can do more stuff remotely. And then uh, that was already struggling because of you know the assault of Airbnb. Retail is down a bit because there are less footfall into city centers. Properties, maybe, I mean, it's not too bad and business, not too bad, but they're probably looking at reductions of maybe 10, 20 percent of tax take. Now, that's not terrible, but the big government tends to have a poor track record of being able to adjust downwards. And you saw New York in the 70s basically almost went bankrupt. And there have been a number of bankruptcies of like Stockton, for example, smaller. And I think Chicago, I can't remember, is a formerly bankrupt on the edge of large cities. So that's one issue. It's fixable with politicians with resolve. They're just going to say, you know, we have 10 percent less people and 15 percent less you know, workers in the city center on any given day. We just don't need quite as much supply of services. So if you cut services in line with, you know, footfall, you're fine. But that just need to happen. Um, so I think that's hard of it. I think we'll, we'll get there. The trickier thing, as you mentioned, is public transport. And the reason that's hard is you look at the numbers from BART. And I was talking to London Underground and I seen the New York subway similar. The BART predicts. 30% permanent drop in 
commuting. And the reason is, you know, office workers with the folks using BART, and if they're only going in three rather than five days a week, they're going to drop a demand. Now, that might be okay, except the fact that they're on a very high fixed cost model. So they can't, you know, they can't make much savings because most of the cost of running BART is the infrastructure and the trains. And if you use them, you know, more or less times a day, you can't dramatically reduce the cost, but the revenues have gone down dramatically because that's proportional to ridership. So, you know, then you could say, well, I don't know where to go. I mean, I think it's going to need some public subsidy because of course, if BART and the New York subway goes bankrupt or slashes lines to focus on the few popular ones, then people flood onto the roads and then you get much worse congestion. So, I mean, the alternative is to say, look, we've been subsidizing roads for a long time because gas tax does not cover the full cost of roads. So implicitly, we're paying for roads. So we should treat roads and rail as the same. Basically, we kind of, you know, we should tax roads in the same to cover the cost of them in the same way that rail operators have to cover the train tracks. But whatever it is, you're right. That is, in some ways, for me, that's one of the thorniest public policy issues is how to deal with actually public transport, which is going to see lower demand and Maybe 20 years from now, driverless cars will make that all redundant. I don't know. But between now and 10, 20 years, it, there is going to be an issue. And I don't want to see BART or the subway go bankrupt or slash lines because that's going to throw people onto the streets and cause gridlock on roads. To your point, right, you, 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 we need public policy that recognizes that the what was true yesterday is not true tomorrow in a post-pandemic world. And we need some bold policies um, that help deal with some of these things. In New York, one of the things that's been out uh, that, that we're, we're going to be rolling out like they did in London is congestion pricing. So there'll be pricing of the amount of cars in the city center, which will help subsidize that and, and hopefully push people back into the subway. But also even from a zoning standpoint, if we can convert older office buildings or older hotels uh, into housing, you know, we could address the affordability of housing challenges while at the same time bringing people back to the city center on non-work hours to support restaurants, to support transit, to support local businesses. So we got to be uh, intentional. You know, the, 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 the other thing on, on policy, and you made the point about the uh, the economic, uh, the, you know, the free markets. You know, I think one of the things I've seen with cities in, in New York and other cities around the country is, a, you know, to be sustainable, um, eventually they got to deal with their affordability challenges, right? There's so much demand of the talent. Housing gets so expensive. Capacity becomes challenged. The quality of life becomes strained. School for their kids becomes challenges. And so... You know, really for having these, these superstar cities, you need to have a superstar region. And so, you know, this donut effect that you refer to it is probably a good thing long term for these cities that truly are magnets for talent because it will give them greater capacity uh, to grow. Totally agree. So, you know, it's amazing that often I talk to journalists, I must have made, I'm totally alone, made this point. I know 20, 30 times that one word that you don't hear nearly as much in 2021 and 2022 is you did pre-pandemic out in the Bay Area in New York is the affordability crisis. And the reason is the pandemic is, again, on a different data set, we've been looking at Zillow. So there's two different data sets in Zillow we've been using is a monthly rents index and a monthly value purchase value index. And they're similar-ish, but rents move more around because they're more short run. But on values, you see that house prices and city center or apartment prices are down about, well, uh, uh, up less by about 20% versus the suburbs. So there's been a big gap that's opened up where if you reverse it, that the center is very expensive and that very expensiveness has fallen by about 20%. And that has definitely pushed back on the affordability crisis. It's not as visible because all property prices in the US have gone up because of the, the slash in interest rates. Every asset class, you know, stocks are up, bonds are up. Bitcoin is up, whatever you invest in, and that includes wine and art, everything is up. But property is unfortunately up as well. The pandemic has meant city center property has gone up a little bit. Suburbs and further out has gone up a lot. So relatively, it's you know, done as best as we could. Another interesting thing on the long run is that for a number of companies, their short run adjustment has been limited by tax and compliance. So just to explain what I mean, there's a lot of companies that I talked to have said, you know what, we've discovered during the pandemic, this division or this group has worked really well, fully remote. And we're thinking we maybe don't need them ever to come back in person. Not many, but you know, 10% of the workforce is kind of in this bucket. And they're saying in the short run, because of tax reasons, like in California, you don't want to have them all go to Nevada and Oregon, because you now have to start to file Nevada and Oregon tax compliance, you know, compliance and legal things. We want you to be fully remote, but remain in the state. 
And that just for California, it's not that restrictive, maybe, but certain smaller states it is. Over time, of course, this stuff is going to get worked through. So it makes no sense for you know Californian companies to restrict people in California. It's going to access the whole national labor market and potentially international if it's more relaxed. So I think in the next you know three to five years, these regulatory and tax impediments are going to be worked through, possibly through outsourcing. So you know, if I set up, I mean I'm not, but if I was to set, I don't know, blue outsourcing. I could say, look, we'll hire these people for you globally, deal with all the tax and compliance, and you just, you know, the, we'll subcontract them to you. So another thing I think we're going to see is a, a big increase of m- mobility of people across the whole country pushing out to areas, you know, take Alaska or Mississippi or places that maybe didn't get such an inflood that has been limited in the short run by these compliance reasons. A lot of companies say, look, they can't, they're telling their employees to stay within the state because they don't want to deal with tax things. But that's not going to be the case three to five years from now. It makes no sense for that to be the case. So the mobility we're seeing is the beginning of an ongoing process. Right. Well, it's going to be interesting to see as the labor market falls more into balance um, and we get more accustomed to, you know, people being back in the workplace, where things settle out on this, uh, on this, you know, hybrid work analysis, right? Because, I mean, it's, it's, it's you know, at some point, there is the the fear of missing out, right? The FOMA situation of people wanting to be here, the interactions, the productivity uh, that's that people feel that's being lost, um, and you know, even when we're talking about inequality, there is also an inequality that uh, when people are working remotely and people are in the office, for them to really participate and have the same advancement potential uh, that the people in the office might have, right? So there's there's some of that that needs to be worked itself through as we as we let this thing transition to whatever that new normal is. So totally so I, I feel very strongly and the evidence I think backs this up pretty strongly that hybrid is here to stay. So one view is hybrid is only here because labor markets are strong and if there's another recession for whatever reason, it will go, disappear. So in fact, I've just been running a randomized control trial and collecting a lot of survey data and you see hybrid not only is loved by employees, so versus fully in person, people report that they're, they're they value hybrid about the same as an 8% pay increase, which is a lot. So we have, you know, we asked them and there's a lot of evidence that people like hybrid because it saves in two days commute. For employers, productivity effects look positive. And the reason is well-designed hybrid, take the Apple plan, you come in Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, you roughly get all the face-to-face time you probably would have had pre-pandemic, but it's now pushed into three days. So you're like, you're never in the office sat quietly in your you know, in your, you know, in your cube, in your office, you're basically there and meeting, 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 coffee, lunch, you know, you, you schedule those three days pretty fully. The big upside for employers is on those two at home days, you get two things. One is it's quieter at home, it will be post pandemic when kids are gone. And there's lots of evidence that people are better on quiet work if it's done in a quiet environment. So think of reading, writing, preparing reports, doing analysis, that's definitely done better at home. And there's some, I have some research showing people are 4% more efficient at home of these kind of quiet tasks. And then the second is the average American saves a bit over an hour a day from less commute and preparation time that they work from home. And in the data we see of time saved, roughly half of it goes into working for your employer. So if you as an employer save your employee two hours a week by letting them work from home for two days a week, they of course get about an extra hour of leisure, so they love it but you also get about an extra hour of work from them. And so collectively, this is why hybrids become the win-win. You know, employees are much happier this, you know, they're kind of 8%, they they, see it's a pretty valuable perk, it's equivalent to about an 8% increase. The employees, employers, sorry, are also happier too because there's productivity goes up. So I don't think that's going anywhere. There are some things now that may end. So this one month work from anywhere (laughs) that's quite popular, uh, you know, Amex, MasterCard, Amazon, Lazard, a number of companies have offered it. It's possible that thing disappears if there's a tough recession, because that's really driven by firms saying, you know, it's so hard to get these 20 somethings that are well educated with, you know, IT skills. So we're going to yep, give yep. them a month to work from anywhere. And then the other thing that is less obvious to me, but Monday, Friday, work from home, that's become a bit of a norm now. Uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday in the office. The reason is employees like that. They like that because it gives them flexibility and they can travel. They do seem to be working properly on the Monday and Fridays. Uh, I don't know whether that will survive, but certainly the one month work from anywhere, I think is, that's not a win-win. I see yeah. hybrid as a win-win. Both sides gain, and so it's very robust, very stable. Yeah. Some of the more extreme versions, 
when the employer feels like I'm just not seeing you enough, your productivity is declining. If there's a recession, they're going to say, okay. It should be that way, right? Because what you're seeing is hybrid also increases that quality of life to your point, increases productivity, but it's got to be well designed. And the other thing that I've seen is that as a manager, it's more incumbent upon you to manage, to determine the productivity and the, of the output of your employee, not necessarily the productivity of the fact that they're in the office. So it requires you to be much more engaged and under, having a clear understanding of what they're trying to achieve and, and following that through, which is, is a process. So just uh, two, two final questions for you that are somewhat related. So the, the first is if you had to give a CEO one piece of advice on how to now transition to figuring out the future of work in the, in the new normal, uh, what would it be? Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to slip it into two, but they're related. So yeah. I would say in the short run, go to vanilla hybrid. So three days in the office, two days at home for your professionals, for your managers. Uh, I'd probably pick three safe days. I might pick basically Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, or Monday, Tuesday, Thursday. I mean, those are two common plans. And I'd say leave that probably operating for six months. In the summer, late fall, or early fall, survey your employees and get a sense of how that's going and what you might want to change and update based on that. The reason I mentioned the survey thing is preferences to work from home are correlated to some extent with demographics and CEOs are not typical. I mean, they're older, they tend not to have, you know, young kids at home. Uh, they, you know, there's certain demographics, they're not representative. So I would survey to find out what the entire company wants and act on that. You don't have to go with everyone's preferences, but at least you want to know what people want and what's the average. It also helps defend decisions because a lot of companies say, oh, I do this and you know, some employees want that, some employees want that. The basic thing is much easier to say we're going for three, two, because that's what the average employee wants, then it's what I want. And so I would go for three, two vanilla hybrid, let it rock for like four to six months, collect data, and then use that to update a long run plan. Yeah, that's, that's good. And, and to your point on collecting data, one of the things we're seeing some of our uh, clients and companies start to use is actually monitoring when people are in the office on a anonymized basis, how much collaboration time is taking place, how many amenities and programs being utilized versus people just being in their office. So they also do have the transparency of the data as well as uh, the survey results. So the second question, similar though, is now you get a call from a mayor from one of those big cities that you rattled off earlier in our, in our conversation. W what would your advice be to the mayor in terms of now having to transition to this new hybrid work paradigm and how to position their city to flourish in this new normal? I mean, I think the first thing would be try and accurately and realistically forecast tax revenues and balance budgets. And it's very hard to lay people off. So it may just be reduced hiring in a lot of areas of public service because you don't want to run big deficit. I mean, that makes life worse. So one thing is going to have to be managing down expenditures because I think tax revenues, I mean, they're growing, but there's a shift down because of the pandemic. The second will be also think about subsidizing public transport in a way that maybe you didn't need to before, particularly rail systems, because if they go bankrupt, you've got a much bigger problem. And if they can't cover costs because ridership's down 30%, there's only two things. You subsidize them or they go bankrupt. If they go bankrupt, well, there's not only in the short run, you know, disruption and people being, you know, loss of job, et cetera. And what are you going to do with all these old railway stations, train, subway stations? But that's going to throw people onto the roads and that's right. going to cause gridlock. So I think that's, I mean, you mentioned it earlier. I think it's a material problem that needs to be budgeted for. And I think it's the city rather than the federal government policy. Yeah. No, I would agree. I would even say similarly the same thing with obsolete office buildings and hotels, which will become more of a, a burden than an asset to those communities, both from a tax standpoint and uh, and and quality of life as we go forward. Nick, this has been this has been a great conversation. Uh, I, I appreciate your insights worth of twenty years worth of uh, research coming to prime time at the right at the right moment as we're all looking for clarity as to what the future of the new normal is, and particularly over these next number of months as people return to the workplace. So. So thank you and uh, look forward to staying in touch and we'll continue to share information with you and vice versa. Likewise, thanks very much, Scott. Great to catch thanks, up. Thanks. thanks. As you just heard, the genie is out of the bottle. Hybrid work is here to stay. But this new style of work is so much more than the occasional Zoom meeting. It will have profound impacts to our cities and surrounding communities. CEOs will need to create a hybrid work environment that keeps their company competitive while also giving their team the work-life balance that it needs and policymakers will need to plan for the reality of the future and not rely on dated rules of the past. Thank you again to Nick Bloom for joining me today. 
And thank you to the 92nd Street Y and to the team for making this episode possible. I'm Scott Reckler from 75 Rockefeller Plaza in New York. See you in a few weeks. Thank you.